Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar which will look at the role social landlords can play in ending UK poverty. All right, thanks for all our attendees for tuning in. I'm Martin Hilditch, I'm Deputy Editor of Inside Housing Magazine and the aim is for today's session, organised with the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, to provide advice and best practice recommendations for landlords looking to fight poverty. I'll be introducing our fantastic panel and talking through the various technical ins and outs in a few moments. Certainly the role of the social, social landlords should play in tackling poverty is a very live debate. In recent years, the government has taken the view that they essentially want social landlords to focus on maximising the number of new homes that they build. The government has essentially been neutral about other activity as long as it doesn't interfere with this central aim. Nonetheless, as we all know, social landlords house significant numbers of people on low incomes. Dealing with the impact of poverty is very much part of their day-to-day -day work. In recent years, various welfare reforms have made that job a little bit more tricky, but also led landlords to develop a much greater understanding of their tenants' needs. New products such as affordable rent have led to debates about allocations policies and who social landlords will house moving forward. External pressures are growing too. The most recent figures show that homeless acceptances in England have surged 10% year on year, up to 15,170 households, and the number of households living in temporary accommodation jumped 9% compared to the same period last year rough sleeping has doubled since um, 2010, or roughly doubled. And if I've made all of that sound slightly overwhelming, don't fear, we've got our panel of experts, as mentioned, lined up today to provide top tips and inspiration for social landlords moving forwards. From the Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust, in a change to the advertise program, uh, Angela Deering is, is ill today, we've got Brian Robson, Policy and Research Manager, and Kevin Butler, Anti-Poverty uh, anti Project Manager. Next up, we've got Paul Tennant, Chief Executive of Orbit Group will be giving us an insight into its approach to tackling poverty. And we'll also be hearing from Steve Borby Coy, Head of Business Excellence at St Ledger Homes, about its approach to helping residents pick up skills and move into employment. Before we kick off, a few words about how the webinar will work. So um, obviously we're just about to move into presentations from a panel of experts. Um, and while those presentations are taking place, um, attendees, audience members um, can fire questions uh, at our panel um, using the, the question box on the right hand side um, of people's screens um, and during the course of presentations I'd, I'd encourage people who aren't uh, presenting our panellists to, to answer some of those questions um, and uh, respond to people as, as we um, move along to make it as interactive as possible and I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on the questions as we go and picking up um, in a discussion that follows the presentation. So once the, uh, the presentations are over, we'll move into a question and answer session. Um, and during that period of time, I'll be picking questions that people have been asking um, from the audience and throwing in probably one or two of my own as well. So I think that just about covers the, um, the ins and outs. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass over to um, Brian Robson um, from the Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust. Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and apologies again that our colleague Angela Deering is unable to join us today. Um, I've stepped in alongside with my colleague Kevin Butler. Um, I work on the policy side, on policy and research for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and Kevin brings uh, the, the practice element from his work with the Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust. So in terms of what we do at JRF and JRHT, I, I hope you might have heard of us. We're one of the largest funders of social policy research in the UK. And we're a housing association as well. We provide homes and care services throughout Yorkshire and the North East. And our purpose, the whole organisation's purpose, is to realise our vision of a poverty-free UK. And we do that by searching out the root causes of poverty and disadvantage, trying to identify solutions to those problems. We try and demonstrate those solutions both in partnership with GRHT within our own housing trust and in partnership with others. And then we try and use that evidence to influence others and achieve social change. So last month was a really significant month for us. Um, JRF launched our comprehensive plan to solve poverty in the UK by 2030. And you can read the full strategy and the supporting research behind it online at jrf.org.uk. And this has been a four-year endeavour for us, producing the UK's first independent strategy to uh, solve poverty right across the life course. Poverty in the UK is real. It's not inevitable. And we think that in the 21st century, it is shameful that 13 million people in our country are living in poverty. And our strategy really sets out a case that it is time for governments, business, communities 
and citizens to work together to solve poverty once and for all. The critical thing about this is no one organisation can do it alone. It's not just a task for government. We need everybody uniting around this organising purpose and uh, we think that should include housing providers too. So just to take you very briefly through the strategy, um, we've got a five point plan. Uh, the first step is around boosting incomes and reducing costs. That's tackling things like poverty premiums, where people in poverty pay more for essential goods and services. It's about an effective benefit system, about making universal credit a genuine poverty reduction tool. It's about improving education standards and raising skills. We want to see a doubling of investment in adult basic skills so that all adults have basic literacy and numeracy and digital skills by 2030. It's about strengthening families and communities. We want to see radical reform of childcare. And it's about promoting long-term economic growth that benefits everyone. So this is about giving mayors and town halls the tools they need to deliver more and better jobs and to deliver inclusive growth that reaches everyone. So what does that mean in terms of housing? Well, there's a four-step plan set out in the strategy. The first step is increasing the supply of affordable homes. We know that we need around 80,000 affordable homes each year in England, and we set out a living rent development framework that can deliver that. It's about more help with unaffordable housing costs, so ensuring that housing benefit keeps pace with the rising cost of housing. It's about pushing up standards in housing, particularly in the private rented sector, and we set out a package of carrots and sticks to encourage uh, private sector landlords to do that. And finally, it is about the bigger role for social landlords, and that's what we want to talk about today. So what can social landlords do? Well, our core product is actually pretty effective. Our evidence shows, as the quote says, that social housing is extremely pro-poor and redistributive. Low rents in particular make a big difference for people in poverty, they ease transitions into work, and the stability that social housing offers is particularly important for older people and families. But interestingly, despite this, when we've looked at housing association business plans and strategies, very few housing organisations state that tackling poverty is an explicit aim in their business plans or strategies. There are notable exceptions to this. We're going to hear from Orbit, St Ledger later today. Other organisations like Trafford Housing Trust, like JRHT, are an anti-poverty landlord and put that at the centre of their plans and strategies. But UK poverty will not be reduced if housing costs are seen simply as a job of government. We believe that social landlords have a part to play and we know that they're already working to reduce poverty by the very nature of social housing. But by going a bit further and making this aim a clear part of their mission, landlords can demonstrate their commitment to ending poverty and make it an essential part of the whole business. So what can landlords do? Well, our strategy sets out four suggestions. Firstly, around aiming to link rents to local incomes, so through a living rent or similar system where rents are directly linked to incomes rather than to uh, the private sector uh, housing market. Uh, we'd like to see more landlords become living wage employers where that's possible. We've done that at JRHT. We know it's not an easy step to take and there are costs involved, but we, we worked through that and we've managed to do that in our housing and care business too. Uh, we think it's about develop, delivering affordable credit to tenants as part of a wider financial inclusion strategy. Kevin can talk to you in more detail about how we're doing that at JRHT. We also held a webinar in July, a similar webinar in partnership with Inside Housing, and that's still available to view on their website. And finally, we think providing employment support is another key role landlords can play. We think this makes good business sense in terms of security of income by moving tenants into work, and obviously it also delivers uh, benefits to the tenants themselves. So those are our key recommendations. So I'll pass you over to my colleague, uh, Kevin Butler now. He leads the Money Smart team at the Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust, and he can talk about more about what we're doing within our own housing trust to deliver this. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Brian said, my name's Kevin Butler, and my job title is the Anti-Poverty Project Manager. Um, I've been in post for about nine months, and when I first came, I was basically tasked with trying anything, testing anything, implementing anything that can both improve our residents' financial well-being, but hopefully their mental well-being as well. Now, the first thing we looked at was trying to break down the barriers between the tenant and the landlord. Uh, quite a few residents uh, may not come forward because they think we might be spying, snooping, things like that. So. One of the first things we've done is to try and separate ourselves a little bit. Hence, we have given ourselves the title of the Money Smart Team. Trying to create a separate identity, hopefully, is bringing along a bit more trust for the residents, 
um, and it provides a useful banner by which we can advertise our, the offer of our services and we can measure whether we've been successful or not. Now I'm going to talk to you briefly about some of the initiatives we've brought in. Many of them are probably being uh, done across other housing associations already. Some of them I think are quite unique to JRHT. Perhaps the first one is the we have a in-house affordable loan scheme. Um, a lot of residents, if they're not able to access high street lending rates, may have to turn to companies such as Bright House, Wonga, other payday loan companies, etc. So what JRHT did was say, look, let's try and help these people meet any unmet needs. Hence, we brought in the affordable loan scheme. What we do, however, is rather than just look at offering loans to the people who come through the door, it's part of a package. So what we will consider, first of all, is if a resident's need can be met by any other alternative, cheaper methods. For example, statutory help, charitable help, etc., where in effect they're not having to pay for their essential purchase. The loan scheme is then offered. Now, to get this loan scheme up and running, we have to go through the Financial Conduct Authority. We do full in-house affordability and risk assessments, so it's not a case that everyone who applies will, will get a loan. Um, Take-up has been relatively small, but for those people we, we have helped, we've been able to see some material savings, especially around the interest rates. We are now working on a employment and training scheme. Um, in my previous work at the Citizens Advice as a Debt Worker, it was clear to see that helping people into work was one way to help them out of poverty, but many people just don't have the skills or the confidence to go through the job search process. So at this moment in time, we're helping people with the search for jobs, writing CVs, helping them with application forms. We're also extending that service not only to the residents, but to local school leavers and also to the staff of JRHT and JRF. We will shortly be implementing the software called My Work Search, which I think many housing associations use, and that's going to be a, a great enhancement to that work. For many years, we've been doing a money and benefits advice service. So this includes maximizing incomes, doing benefit checks, um, reducing costs where possible. We're currently working on a big scheme around reducing energy costs. And we've been able again to make great savings to people. One of the key things from my previous work at the Citizens Advice was a lot of people, a lot of residents, are not aware of financial products and services that can help them to save money. And as a result, they do end up with a high high street or the high rate lenders. So as part of our work, there's an awful lot of education going on where we're sort of doing blogs where we can inform people of savings of benefits they can apply for, money saving tips, etc, etc. So if we know this information, it's important we can pass it on. Um, one of the big issues as well that we're currently working on, which everyone is going to be affected by, is obviously the introduction of universal credit next year. Um, we did a recent survey amongst our residents, and most residents have either not heard of it, don't think it will affect them, um, and therefore have, have not really taken much action. From this, we've now got a plan in place of helping our residents, and that includes things like digital inclusion. A lot of people said they haven't got access to uh, the internet, and as we know, universal credit's going to need a great need for the internet, computers, smartphones, etc. A lot of people are going to need help with budgeting, with the one monthly payment, and again, the search for either new employment or extra hours. So it's been a big piece of work around that, and hopefully we're going to be prepared for when the full rollout comes out early next year. This is just a snapshot of some of the work we're doing to empower the residents to take control of their position. But JRHT as a landlord, we are also looking at what we can do internally. So uh, a lot of work is around making sure our housing stock is energy efficient, um, we're looking at, for the smaller properties, having water meters fitted, for example, because that can usually save money if it's a, a smaller household. Obviously, an ongoing review of costs, which I'm sure every housing association is doing. 
We offer staircasing both up and down for residents who are in financial difficulties. And I think the last point, um, JRHT and JRS, something I've found since I've been here is we are prepared to take risks and to try things which either may or may not work for the benefit of our residents. Um, and I think this is probably part of my work to continue trying things. Hopefully, you know, if we can improve our residents' financial well-being, then job done. And that's probably it from me. So I will hand you back to Martin and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, uh, both Brian and, and Kevin there. Um, plenty of food for thought, and I think we've had a question already about um, how much it costs to set up the affordable loan scheme, which um, perhaps you can get back to in the question box. Uh, right, without further ado, I will hand you over to Paul Tennant, the Chief Executive of Orbit. Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just wait for the presentation to come up. I'm hoping the presentation will come up. Thanks, Martin. <laughs> OK. Um, the view that we take is that social landlords do have a significant role to play in addressing poverty, I mean, in particular, child poverty. This started for us back in 2011-12. We produced our business plan for 2013 to 2020 and set out nine clear objectives that we wish to deliver. Those picked up key issues around provision of homes, services, and obviously investment in community. The analysis itself was the most important thing for us because it did identify the type of world that we expected to be growing into as an organization. And what came out in particular was a whole raft of social issues, but two very strong messages. One was the increasing inequality we didn't expect to see in society over the next seven to 10 years. And the expectation is that in many cases, for a lot of people, that's only going to get worse. And the other interesting thing was about how technology will change our world and change that of our residents and indeed our staff. So as an organization, we used that research to identify what we thought we needed to address over the next seven years. That data allowed us to start understanding more about our broadly 100,000 customers and also allowed us to understand what that new world will look like, the fact that we will be part of the civic infrastructure of this country, and I think with 1,300 housing associations, we have a very strong infrastructure which allows us to be part of that. I think it was recognized that we'll have a changing role as organizations. That was partly on the back of changing government policy, and often in many cases we were filling vacuums and supporting services that were both being, being withdrawn out of communities. I think what we also recognize is that we moved on from managing property to sustaining tenancies and to supporting people as individuals and enabling them to deal with their current environment, but hopefully to move on from that. So it was very much as the, as the previous point about empowering residents and enabling our customers to take part in society in a much more proactive role rather than necessarily being in the receipt of a benefit check and feeling as if they were given to by society rather than being part of society. So in order to, so just to move forward on the slides, Martin, I'm trying to, I'm not. Thank you. So we took a strategy of why, what, and how. Why this mattered to us as an organization is because 25% of the children in our communities are growing up in poverty. We undertook our own research to understand what our current customer base was and what we could try and do with that data. The worrying thing is that 20% of customers say they don't have enough money to meet their monthly outgoings. Again, difficult situation for families to deal with. And often in many cases, again, from our own angle on this, the implications on families and on children can be quite destructive as a result of this. And obviously, the areas that we work in are tough areas They do have um, very low in, uh, indices, the deprivation indices are, are very challenging in these areas. Often we have seaside resorts, as well as the places highlighted there, we also have uh, Great Yarmouth, again, an area which has had a, a lot of problems over the years. So we wanted as an organization to understand what we could do about this. So the why question is, why does this matter to us? Well, actually, child poverty and poverty generally does matter to us, and we think it should matter to the sector overall. From my own point of view, 
as part of being the, the Child Institute president a few years ago, I focus particularly on child poverty and I'm now a, an ambassador for the Child Poverty Action Group and I do think it's really important that we understand that as an organisation, as a sector, because in my view it's that next generation of young people and you know as well as I do that it becomes a cycle, it's very hard to break out of that cycle and I would argue over the last 20 years breaking out of that cycle for poor children has become even more difficult. So I think there's a real job we need to do to help people move on from that and our 50th year work next year as an organisation will be looking at how we address that next generation of people coming through our stock and help them to break out of that deprivation, deprivation situation as we see it. Can you control go on to the next slide? I can't see move that at the moment, thanks. So what we wanted to do as an organisation was to identify some very practical actions that we can do because we wanted to make sure that as well as having the strategies and we fully support the GRF plan and strategy and we're pleased that many of the things that we are doing match with that. But in many ways it was about doing the bleeding obvious, it was about making sure as an organisation we were working with our customers and work with our communities to find things that could make a difference around child care, offering people small grants to get furniture, and then we could get white goods, even down to getting curtains. We now have a relationship with a local firm of solicitors and all of their staff supplies with curtains they don't need. Those curtains then make their way across to uh, our residents. So again, it's how we work with other agencies to support that um, recycling, but nevertheless helping people where they might have had some particular difficulties. And I think that working in partnership has been a key area that we want to try and draw out I think our sector does have good experience of doing that, but I don't think we necessarily do it around this area. It might probably just because of a lack of awareness, but I do think there's a lot more we can do. And I think, again, as you can see with the GRF, there's a huge amount of best practice we can share. A lot of ideas have been developed and thought through. And again, with the GRF, some risk has been taken and some have been tested, but it allows us to understand what that can do. And I do genuinely think that allows us to develop this agenda and influence locally, regionally and nationally as housing organisations around those key uh, four points that came forth from GRF. So I think it does match in with our own agenda as organisations. One of the things that strikes me very clear is that with 1,300 housing associations in the country, we are really part of the civic infrastructure. We do work with many, many residents. We've got access to an awful lot of communities and I actually think that we are seen as being the acceptable face of bureaucracy in many, many areas. And I think we've got to use that opportunity to enable our residents to tackle some of these very difficult situations which we'll see over the next few years. Moving on to the next slide, please, Martin. The how. What we'd like to see is greater research being done by organisations within their existing customer base what we have seen is, for our own analysis, that it was almost a hidden problem. It was something we assumed was there, we just didn't have a, a great deal of knowledge around it. We need to understand that more effectively, understand the pockets, and where possible, understand some of the causes. On the back of that, we developed our own four areas that we've worked on. Employment and training has been a key area for us. What we have managed to do is to achieve a, a large number of job outcomes from customers. It's interesting the relationship that has on arrears levels, but also on people's well-being and their self-worth. But we've used this as an opportunity to break out some of those cycles of families being held back by poverty and by deprivation. We have focused on health and well-being again, but interestingly also seeing improvements around antisocial behaviour on sites and make sure that we do support residents to feel better in themselves and support their health plans going forward. The financial advice we've given has brought in multiple millions of gains for customers. But I think, again, that has really been the outcome there is improving people's lives and improving their choices and their chances in their lives. And again, the digital inclusion is an interesting one. That's the fourth area we work on. Because if you are trying to improve educational attainment, access to digital solutions, access to technology is important for families so that their children can work on their schoolwork and other such things as that. So we've tried to make sure we understand what we can do at a very practical level. We've also then put a social value on that and using the hacked method, then we've got something like a £3.4 million net benefit of the investment that we've put in. So what we want to try and do is to see organisations have a pledge. As a sector, we think we can include, say, 10 
key items that we're going to work on, very clear practical actions, something which draws us together. But when I look through organizations' business plans, a lot of what we do is there. It just doesn't seem to be drawn out as a poverty agenda or something which is working particularly around child poverty. I think if organizations sat down and did that, they could extract a great deal of what we are currently doing and then build on that. So I'm certainly not saying that's not there within organizations, but I think the sector would benefit by drawing that to the fore and keeping that to the front of their minds in terms of how they develop their strategies and address solutions going forward. I'm happy to leave my views at that point. Back to you, Martin. All right, thanks very much, Paul. Um, plenty of food for, for thought there, um, and lots to pick up on uh, questions and answers afterwards. And there's some questions coming through. Um, do keep them coming, and we'll, we'll um, pick them up as we uh, go along, and certainly in the question and answer session afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Steve Paul Bicoy, Head of Business Excellence at St. Ledger Homes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to share what St. Ledger Homes is doing to help the people of Doncaster into work. And I'm hoping that my slides will appear on screen shortly. There they are. Um, we established World of Work as part of our work around community engagement, but also around social and economic regeneration. So it's very much concerned with helping people out of poverty. Uh, everything we do at St. Ledger Homes, we do in close alignment to our values. So what we call our feel values, which you can see on screen there. What this means for our World of Work program is um, we, we achieve fairness to, by engaging with people who may be out of work or be faced with barriers to education or training. Uh, we try and achieve excellence through delivering high quality skills development and work experience opportunities which provide a route to employment or further training. We empower people so we support individuals to develop their skills and improve their confidence enabling them to seek out and take up new opportunities and to overcome some of the challenges that they face. Uh, and we do that locally, so we work in partnership with local training providers and employers uh, and contribute to increasing the skills and employability of those local people and enabling them to make a difference to their own lives and those of their families, friends and the local community. Um, St. Ledger Homes is an arm's length management organisation, so we're an ALMO. We manage around 20,500 uh, council houses and commercial properties on behalf of Doncaster Metropolitan Borough Council. Our World of Work program, uh, which we like to call WOW, uh, includes a number of different opportunities that you can see on screen there. So uh, we incorporate uh, apprenticeships, which are typically in sort of crafts and trades areas, so plumbers and joiners and electricians, but we also have administrative roles. So we have an apprentice who currently works with the directors in our exec support team. Um, we offer work experience for adults of all ages as well as, school, uh, as, well as school pupils, so uh, for adults this tends to be up to about two days per week for eight weeks, so it doesn't impact on the benefits and things, and for school age pupils this tends to be uh, one or two weeks full time, uh, which is the sort of traditional work experience that people will have understood if they've gone through that at school themselves. Um, we also offer three paid college or university student placements each year, so one in each of our three directorates. Uh, this year we've got placements in HR, IT and in housing services. Um, employment support, so our opening doors skill support um, includes helping people with applications and CV writing, interview skills, etc., similar to what um, Joseph Browntree was talking about earlier. And we offer that to anyone who's engaged with, with any one of our other schemes. Uh, the support and learn contracts are temporary paid contracts. They're typically six or eight months, depending on uh, the area of the business that we take people into. And it's these last two aspects, really, so support and learn contracts and employment support. Those two aspects of our world of work support that I'd like to focus on for the next couple of minutes uh, because we're particularly proud of how they're really helping our tenants uh, out of poverty. So Support and Learn was established really as a way to help some of our unemployed tenants back into work by providing a qualification and some real work experience. Our first Support and Learn, our first support and Learn participants came into the programme in 2014. Uh, and we've grown and expanded the scheme since then. So participants start by attending a course at the local college in Doncaster, and that's typically about two weeks, but we have recently tried out a four-week course, um, which is in a slightly different area of work. And the courses really depend on the areas of the business that we can potentially offer contracts in, and we've typically got around 10 people on a cohort at any one time. Uh, 
Uh, once they've completed the course at college, everyone in the cohort is offered the opportunity to join St. Ledger Homes for a six or eight month period. Uh, some people find that the college course has given them what they need uh, and they go on to find work or they opt in for some few, uh, further training, perhaps through the college again. Uh, and I should point out that we work with other local employers as well, so we try and find work experience or paid opportunities uh, outside of our business, um, similar probably to what other organisations are doing. When we started the scheme, we offered a customer service course which led into a variety of areas of our business. Uh, we've had particular success bringing trainees in to help deliver our environmental program, uh, so fence building and things like that in particular. Uh, what they get out of it is they work together as a team, they build a really good camaraderie, they establish good working patterns, and we've had really, really positive feedback from tenants and residents who are delighted with the job that's been done for them. So uh, what they report back is that the team are polite, they're friendly, they're hardworking. Um, we've grown the offer based on feedback from people who have been through the, the programme. So we're trying to understand what their needs are, but also we want to be able to fit in with what we can accommodate within the business. So we now offer a handy person course, and we offer a cleaning course, uh, which we provide training contracts for within our empty properties, our voids team. Uh, so they're clearing, preparing homes for new tenants. We, uh, we provide a structured work placement, so individuals are working alongside more experienced staff who act as mentors and help to train them. We have managers and team leaders who are given specific training to help them manage uh, individuals who may not be used to regular work, so they act as coaches and mentors. We find that the participants, particularly if they've been out of work for a long time, uh, can have issues with timekeeping and attendance, and we manage them in line with our normal policies and procedures. Uh, but we are kind of giving, putting extra support in place for, for the individuals and for the managers and team leaders um, just to be sort of recognising that these uh, people are a little bit more vulnerable or need a bit more support in some areas. Uh, we're keen to help with removing as many barriers as we possibly can, so we work closely with our local Job Centre Plus to make sure benefit claims aren't affected or to help with working tax credits and to help people access additional support uh, such as clothing for interviews, that kind of thing. We work with South Yorkshire Passenger Transport to offer public transport passes, uh, and I think in one case we even covered the cost of a few hours of childcare, which was the difference between that person being able to attend college or drop out of the course. So we try and be as flexible as we possibly can. We, we also signpost and refer individuals to other sources of support, so perhaps for help with debt or substance misuse, uh, as well as other training and benefits and, and work opportunities. What we see is sometimes seemingly small things can really be the difference between somebody engaging with a scheme or not, uh, and that can be the difference between them getting into work or not. Uh, we're really proud of what we've been able to achieve in a relatively short amount of time, so on screen you'll see some of the outputs and the outcomes. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to get people into work, so this is uh, approximately two-thirds of the people who join our support and learn scheme uh, go on to find a job or have gone on to find a job so far. The qualifications, learning and experience that we've given has helped prepare people really for regular work. Um, so things like help with timekeeping and, and things is really, really important actually. So in some people, in some cases we've found that the people coming through the course um, come from families where unemployment is a third or fourth generation issue even, so going to work is not normal for them. But we're help, helping to challenge and really break those cycles. We're building a really strong reputation, I think, as a good employer to work for in Doncaster and as an organisation with a commitment to help the local community we serve. Uh, World of Work has been recognised with awards, which are always nice, of course, but the most important thing, of course, is the difference that World of Work makes to individuals and their families. Uh, if you do have time after today's webinar, we have a number of videos on our YouTube channel where you can hear participants telling their own stories, and they're, they're really powerful. Uh, and some of those images that you've seen, some of the pictures are those people that have gone through the course. They are, they are real people, not, uh, not actors. So look into the future. We're wanting to really develop the ways to work with people who aren't our tenants as well. So we want all the people who live on the estates that we manage across Doncaster to have opportunities to improve their prospects, uh, to raise families in good quality homes, safe neighbourhoods, and in communities where people help and support each other. Uh, and that's all I've got to say today. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I can see there's a couple of questions coming in, so I'll try and answer some of those as we go. I'm going to hand back to, uh, back to Martin now. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, plenty to talk about and um, plenty of questions coming through. Um, I'm going to kick off um, with one of my own and then I'll move into the, 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 the questions um, that have come through. Um, and I guess it, it harks back to um, something both um, uh, Brian 
uh, and Paul um, touched on. Um, and Brian was talking about very few uh, um, housing associations have tackling poverty at the centre of their approach, you know, part of their mission. And I guess I just wanted to ask, um, are, as, a, as a whole, are, are social landlords currently doing um, enough to end poverty? And, and I guess what's holding them back? Is it, is it external factors or, or is it their, effectively their own ambition, their own um, approach? Um, so Brian, if I can maybe start with you on that and then I'll, I'll probably move to Paul and then I'll move to questions um, from the audience. Um, I think if you, if you look back to the kind of original purpose of housing associations, a lot of them were set up and their founding deeds referred to kind of, you know, helping people in housing need. But as we all know, the housing crisis now is so broad that just helping people in housing need could, could refer to a very broad range of people and not all of whom would be in poverty. Um, I think actually, you know, and this is part of the case we've been trying to advance through the whole of the anti-poverty strategy, that there is, there's a mutual interest in tackling poverty. poverty costs everybody, um, it costs the state uh, an awful lot of money, 78 billion a year, but it costs housing associations too in terms of lost rental income, in terms of the, the cost of voids when things go wrong. So there's a real mutual interest in, in tackling poverty um, for, for housing associations. There's a good business case to do so. Um, obviously I think some of the things do need government action, so the support for housing costs that we've recommended, that does need action from government as only government can provide housing benefit. But there are things that, as we've outlined, that housing associations can do in thinking about their rental strategy uh, and in just taking an anti-poverty approach all the way through their business, including for, for employees. And Paul, um, I'd be interested to, uh, again, from what you're talking about, I mean, I know you said um, uh, when you were um, uh, uh, president of the CIH that, that, that um, you made it very much part of your um, uh, your role to be talking to people about uh, uh, about this issue. Um, do do you think do, do you feel like you're a kind of outlier, or do you think you're you're very much part of a body of work that the sector's doing? Um, so again, so, so social landlords be doing um, more to end poverty, or, or do, you, do you think actually everybody's moving in that direction? Paul, can you? Paul, I don't know, don't know whether you heard that. I was just, just, just asking whether you, you kind of feel whether uh, that you're an outlier or whether you think um, most, most social landlords are kind of doing um, a, a pretty um, impressive body of work to um, help end poverty. I think, I think we've got some problems with the sound from Paul there, um, so I'll, I'll just... Um, Get, get our technical guys on, on this end to, to get in touch, and I'll move on to some questions from the audience. Paul, if you can hear me, uh, we'll come back, come back to you and pick up on that um, uh, point in, the, in a minute. Um, okay, so the, the next question I wanted to pick up on um, is one from the, um, the audience, um, and it's um, from John O'Sullivan. Um, and he was, he was talking about, uh, he, well, he's asking, uh, he said, the work that uh, GRH, uh, GRH is uh, doing, it sounds like it's preventative. Um, what measures are they trying to uh, capture to prevent uh, the benefit overall um, uh, to the state or the NHS? And uh, I, so I guess we've done some work previously um, uh, with landlords um, looking to uh, at the way they evidence the work they've done, um, how, so how effective they are in terms of evidence, evidencing um, uh, the impact of um, various anti-poverty measures and there are some great pieces of the work out there, absolutely fantastic, but also there were some where you thought actually they haven't followed through to, to look at uh, the wider impact um, and, and measure that. Um, so yeah, I mean it, again to go back to John's question, how, how good, um, how, how are you yourselves at JRF looking to um, prove the benefit of the work and how good are, are social landlords at doing this? Um, so uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, Brian or Kevin, if I can come back to, to, to you first on that, and then I might move to, to Steve. Um, yeah, well, we make use of the, um, the hacked social, social impact calculator, um, and then in all the interventions we're taking, you know, Kevin, Kevin said we're, we're doing a lot of experimenting and trying new things, and uh, certainly for the loan scheme, we've commissioned an independent evaluation of that as it goes along, so we're, we're talking to tenants who've accessed loans, uh, tenants who've approached us that haven't been accepted for a loan, 
our tenants who haven't accessed the scheme at all to find out where that is and to try and uh, develop a body of evidence sitting behind that. But I think this does kind of link into a, to a wider conversation for the sector about its standards of evidence and you know when we're trying to take evidence to, to health and to, to, to other agencies, sometimes our standards of evidence aren't as, as thorough or as high as people, you know, health commissioners and so on might expect. Um, and I know HACT has been doing a lot of work on this in terms of trials and things. And uh, we're about actually to, to launch a collaboration with HACT where we're going to be looking at the housing provider role in employment and looking to do some, uh, some trials uh, to demonstrate the impact of that and to really, to really identify what works in housing providers and employment. And that was one of the things that we particularly identified when we were researching the anti-poverty strategy. But there was a lot of activity around housing providers and employment, but there wasn't a lot of evidence um, sitting beneath that about what was the best approach to take. So what, what were the interventions that work? And clearly, it does seem that some of them, like the St. Ledger project, have been really, really effective. Um, but in terms of the, the, the really solid kind of randomized control style uh, trial, standards of evidence, um, there's not always the, the, that kind of evidence available. So we're looking to, to support the sector to, um, to try and create more of that kind of uh, high high quality evidence um, that we can take to other sectors and really demonstrate the the valuable impact our work has. Great, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's absolutely vital for the the sector to to do that. Um, uh, Steve, can I uh, come come to you next um, and just to, uh, talk to you about how you're uh, making sure that you do um, um, uh, get that evidence base in in place, Steve. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge to be honest, and we probably like that lag behind um, doing the delivery. So uh, what we are looking now is is kind of over the next couple of years, how are we going to expand and develop this, and what we're wanting to do by expanding our program beyond our tenants is really we're looking for external funding to help with that, um, because we can't necessarily use sort of HRA type funding to be able to to do something for for non tenants. Although there is a community engagement angle. We are trying to be a bit stricter in terms of what we measure and how we measure it, but we haven't got a very wide uh, or, or in-depth uh, body of evidence to support exactly what we're doing and the real difference it makes. All we can do is that kind of very simple, this person was out of work and now uh, they've found they've found work straight after, after leaving. What we want to do is something a bit more longitudinal as well, so we want to talk to people who uh, came through the scheme two years ago, where are they now? Because we, we, we'd be concerned, I think, if we found that we bring somebody in, give them a bit of a, a, a lift and boost them with skills and things, but then you know, 12 months later or six months later, they're, they're back um, back where they were. We, we don't want that to happen, but we, we don't, at the moment, have that long-term uh, evidence, and we're just kind of building that into our strategy now. Yeah, uh, really, really interesting, and I think um, uh, and apologies to Paul if you're trying to come in on this. Um, I, I think you've been able to answer questions in the in the question box, um, but uh, still, still um, uh, not getting the sound from you at the moment. So we'll um, uh, pick up pick up in a moment. Um, uh, move, moving on, I, there was an issue that um, Rebecca Horton raised um, about technology. Um, so it's a, a bit of a jump, but. Um, asking um, sometimes when tech is introduced there's an expectation that everybody will use it how do we support tenants that don't have the technology and so it's certainly an, an issue I'm quite interested in I mean I was over in the um, uh, the States a few years ago um, looking at the the way a, a landlord over there was dealing with um, its waiting list uh, effectively what it was doing was opening its waiting list after a period of time where it had been closed um, and tenants were expected to um, uh, access that online. So any, any tenants who were turning up were being turn, turned away and told to either go home or go to a library and, and um, uh, go online to access the waiting list and apply. Um, a very, very, very different system to here. So it certainly was um, a bit tricky for, for tenants who um, perhaps would struggle um, to, to, to get online. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wondered um, what the panel's um, view of that is, and I will go to, um, I'll start, start with um, JRF again first, if that's okay, because um, we just moved on from Steve, so um, Brian, or, or Brian or Kevin. Hi, it's Kevin speaking again. Um, what we are doing at JRHT, we are sort of looking at the individual needs of the person. Now, if, um, for example, the person already has the technology and they feel confident in using it, a lot of our work can be just signposting people onto particular websites, particular application forms, and answering any questions as they go through the process. We are seeing a number of people who would like 
um, to use technology more and who are probably going to need to use technology more, especially you know the way benefit applications are going, the way that savings can be made online, etc. So one of the things we've been doing is at our main centre in New Earswick, um, we make available some of our own in-house computers. People can either come in and use those either on their own or if they need our assistance we're more than happy to sit down with people and go through application forms etc and, and show them where they can find information. We also have a dedicated digital inclusion worker working at the organization and her role has been to basically get out and about and help people where possible either looking for how to use technology, funding for it or, or just general training. Um, we've been quite fortunate that recently TalkTalk Talk have brought Superfast Broadband to the village and as part of that one of our empty shops for the next six months has been turned into a basically an information hub where residents can turn up and they can attend various training courses, they can ask questions, they can seek help, even if it's just how to switch a computer on or if they've got more technical questions. We've been running some sessions here around price comparison websites, uh, online banking, uh, also this morning we were running one about claiming benefits <coughs> online. So we, we very much see it is, as horses for courses. We, we need to gauge the level of, of the resident of their skills and confidence, but we do make ourselves available when we can to not, not sort of put them off using technology because we clearly identify the benefits. Great. Okay. Um, uh, no, th thanks very much for that. Um, and I'll just, because um, there's, there's quite a lot to get through, there are some specific questions um, coming up about some of the work um, um, that uh, you guys have been doing um, over at, at JRF, so I, I don't know whether you can maybe pick up on, on some of those in, in the boxes and I'll try and get through as many as possible um, uh, in, in the, uh, the question and answer session. Um, and I, I, I guess there's, a, there's another question I wouldn't mind um, picking up on um, from uh, who was it from? Uh, Donna, Donna Worship, um, which um, talks about uh, when you're successful in helping tenants out of poverty, do they retain the right to remain in social housing if they uh, can afford to move on? And I think it's the second part of the question really that potentially want to get into. How do you ensure a supply of housing is available to those who need it most? So how, how do you kind of balance those two things? Um, so move, moving tenants out of uh, poverty um, and ins ensuring that there's a supply of housing available to, um, to, to those who are in the, 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 the greatest need. Um, and I'm going to try Paul and see whether he's, he's in or not. I think, uh, no, I think he's still out. Um, so I'll um, move to Stephen first with that and then I'll, I'll move uh, back to Brian and Kevin. So um, Steve, do you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, thanks. I think that's a quite a, a big and, and difficult question. <laughs> if we need an answer to that, we'd probably be running the country, wouldn't we? But um, there's something, <clears throat> I think, in it for um, for us. I think what I'm focusing on really is today is to really talk about what we're doing to help people out of poverty. I think those other aspects are not something I can uh, offer a, a, a big view on because it's not something that I have an awful lot of experience in. I'm sure other panellists have have more of an opinion on that, but um, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of say I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, if that's okay. No, no, absolutely fine. And um, Brian and Kevin, I'd be interested in your your opinions on that as well. Um, so I, I mean, again, it's, I think the, the 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 nub of that question from Donna was um, if you're helping if people are helping tenants out of poverty. Um, um, what, what's the, the balance between them remaining in social housing? I guess you're getting to issues like pay to stay, um, um, uh, the government's um, uh, policy to uh, get people who are uh, better off to pay more to um, uh, stay in their, their, their social home, um, and how you ensure that you've still got a, a steady supply of housing available to those who need it the most. So, so Brian or Kevin, I, I don't know who wants to step in on that. Um, well, I mean, we, we, we want mixed income communities, so uh, we, you know, we've gone to quite a lot of lengths to ensure that our community in New Earswick, which Joseph Browntree founded and was always intended to be a kind of a mix of incomes and a mixed income community, has, has remained so. So we wouldn't want really to see people moving on just because they, they've got on in life and, you know, kind of managed to escape poverty. Um, 
We have always been keen on flexible tenure, so we've introduced shared ownership into New Earswick, and so we have shared owners who can staircase so up as their circumstances change. And then we're developing a, a new garden village for the 21st century on the outskirts of York, which is called Derwentthorpe, which again is going to be a, a, a mixed income community. We've got David Wilson Homes for part of Barrett, building homes for sale, JRHT building homes for the low cost social rent and for and for shared ownership. So our, our our hope would be that you can kind of do it with carrots. You know, you can offer people kind of flexible tenure, moves into shared ownership and so on. One of the things we looked at um, in the production of the strategy was whether there was a case for fixed term tenancies and, and trying to move people on. And ultimately we concluded that actually moves are very bad for some people, particularly for children. Um, and also that you know we do want to create mixed income communities. Um, we, we don't necessarily want to move people on. And in, in the places where fixed term tenancies have been tried in London, when affordable rents were brought in, a lot of landlords experimented with fixed term tenancies. And the academic evidence from those trials has been that actually there's a lack of move on options. So at the end of the five years, even if the uh, tenant was capable of, of, of leaving social housing, there isn't an attractive, uh, stable offer to move them on into. So we think it's about ultimately building more homes. So that 80,000 homes a year we need and that the mix of our framework would be kind of half, uh, at least half at rents linked to incomes and the, the other half uh, intermediate or um, low cost home ownership products that give people that kind of attractive offer they can move on into uh, when their circumstances change. It seems perverse to me that you know we offer people social rent properties, we'll offer them the right to buy when they can afford that, but there's there's not actually a lot in between. You know, so that kind of flexible tenure uh, can be really important. And I'm, I'm going to uh, again I appreciate the time. I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is um, from Helen Middleton, and she is saying, given the financial pressures facing housing associations, what appetite exists to help tenants set up community-based enterprises? Um, and, and I guess we're talking about tenant empowerment, so the, the, the difference between, I guess, um, uh, you know, providing an, uh, an employment scheme or, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, um, and, and genuine tenant empowerment. So, uh, you know, how, how do you get that balance right? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll come back to, to Brian and Kevin in a minute on that. But, um, Steve, if I can maybe start with you, I think we're still having uh, difficulties with Paul, but he is. Um, answering questions at a rate of knots in the questions box. So if you've got any more for, for him, um, keep them coming via the, the questions box. So Steve, if I can throw that question over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're, at similar terms, we're really keen to help people um, into self-employment as well as employment. So it's something we're, we're kind of conscious of that work um, it can be a variety of different sort of colours and flavours. Really, I think it can be it can be anything you want it to be. And so we're very much keen on uh, self-employment as well as, as what we're talking about here in terms of community-based enterprises. So we're we're trying to help people do that through our community engagement. Uh, we want to do more. I think from than what we do, we offer obviously through our world of work, we offer paid contracts that are either with us. Uh, or increasingly will be with, with other local employers, but there's a limit to what we can do with that because of the way it's funded through, through HRA money and things like that. So we're looking for that external funding that helps us to do that. Um, we, we're also thinking about um, other training opportunities, really. So we, we did talk about sort of CV writing and things like that, which, which are opportunities which we provide for our apprentices, for people that come in on work experience uh, from school, those kind of things. But we also want to offer... Um, our sort of in-house training courses, whether that's health and safety related or legislative you know, data protection, that kind of thing as well. So we're, we're having a look at how we can offer additional training opportunities based on courses that we'll be running anyway um, to, to try and bring tenants in to, to help boost their skills and, and knowledge in other areas. So we're looking at those kind of things, but I think particularly in terms of community-based enterprises, we are very keen to to help uh, tenants and residents uh, to, to sort of form things for themselves and we'll support where we can, um, but we, we are sort of conscious that we need more funding to be able to do that. Great, thanks, thanks Steve. And I'm going to pick up on a question um, from Marie Henry, and um, uh, uh, if you want to come back to the previous one, uh, uh, Brian or Kevin, then please do. Um, and she's just asked, with the 1% rent cut, how are boards reacting? Um, uh, so uh, I, I guess are some, some kind of um, poverty reduction initiatives um, biting the dust, how concerning is that, um, and what's, what's, I guess, is the advice um, to housing associations and their boards? Um, so uh, again, Brian or, or Kevin, if you can jump in on that one, please. 
I think with the uh, reduction, what it what it's forced probably every housing association to do is obviously to look at its own costs, its own income streams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So certainly from JRHT's point of view, um, obviously rent forming the majority of our income, the investment in people like myself, our housing support officers, etc. You know where where rent arrears. Uh, are being seen. It's all about early intervention, it's all about supporting the resident, it's all about helping them to sort of get back on track through the various measures we're doing. And if obviously then we have more people paying the rent, and if we keep a, a constant view on our own costs, then the view has been taken that whilst it is tough, uh, you know, lots of other bodies have had bigger cuts than ourselves, so it's something we're confident we can steer through. If I can just quickly return to the previous question as well about uh, people looking to be self-employed, social enterprise and stuff. Uh, we ran a, a project for three months in New Year's where we had uh, an empty shop space and, and we set up this little shop called The Open Shop and it was available for residents and other people from the local area to come in and again take courses around setting up business, around learning marketing skills talking to people who'd been there, done that, you know, give it, people swapping phone numbers, websites, et cetera, et cetera. And as an organization, we've also been working with uh, an organization called Unlimited, who basically support social entrepreneurs who want to set up social enterprises. So again, whenever we come across a resident who talks about being self-employed, um, we can signpost people onto this organization. So hopefully then they'll get the expert advice, financial funding that can, you know, kickstart a business for them. Great, thanks very much. We, we are fast running out of time. I think we've got a couple of minutes um, left by the looks of it, um, looks of the clock. Um, I just want to throw in one more um, uh, question uh, with regards to the JRF report about solving poverty in the UK. And you've talked about scaling up housing first models in the UK. Um, mm. And uh, for those who don't, who don't know, I think the, the, the rough gist is that you um, um, place people who are homeless in, in housing and solve that issue before starting to address some of the other, the other um, um, uh, issue, issues they might have. And I, I just wonder what the feeling is about what housing associations and councils should be looking to do in order to facilitate that. Um, um, and uh, maybe, maybe a bit from left field, but uh, yeah, I just, just wanted to get a kind of take take from, um, uh, again, Brian, uh, perhaps on um, uh, what, yeah, what, what housing associations and councils should be looking to do in that area. Yeah, well, so um, the anti poverty strategy strongly backs Housing First, which we think should be the default option for um, homeless adults with complex needs. Um, really, really strong international evidence behind it. Um, not the quantity of UK evidence, but what there is is really promising. Um, and as you say, it involves putting people in a home and then wrapping the support they need around them. Um, and the critical thing is the existence of that support. And I think it, it, it's disappointing in a way because it's, it's a really promising evidence-based intervention that we reckon could save the public sector as a whole about £200 million after two years if it was scaled up. But it obviously needs the homes to be made available. And I think that's where housing associations and councils could play a role in carefully, you know, through, a, through an allocations and lettings plan, identifying some homes that could go towards housing first. But critically, it does need the support to be available. And obviously, um, everybody in the sector will be familiar with the, um, with the, the kind of LHA changes that might, um, might endanger that support and the uncertainty around future funding for supported housing. But the critical thing is, yeah, that it has that support wrapped around people to help them. We think it's really positive. Deinstitutionalizes people, it, you know, kind of settles them uh, alongside everybody else and enables them um, to live a more normal life and the, the really promising thing is that the, the rates of housing retention amongst those people are really high, over 90%, you know, right after a year, 90% of people are still in their homes. So we think it's really, really promising, but like I say, it does need the homes to be available and the money to fund the support, which is essential. Um, sorry, just very quickly on that point, if you're a housing association or a council interested in that, what should you kind of look to do to, to um, uh, perhaps enable that? I appreciate the point about um, making sure there's supports in place, but, but uh, how, how would they bring through kind of pilot projects or, or indeed if yeah. you talk about being the default option, make sure that happens. 
Yeah, and there's a team at Hormus Link um, who are, have, have secured funding to kind of uh, you know roll out kind of schemes within England. So I'd encourage you to get in touch with Hormus Link, talk to them about their kind of repository of best practice in this. There's some good academic work out there. So if you look at stuff that Nicholas Police at the University of York's produced, or Suzanne Fitzpatrick at Harriet Watt, um, have a read of that. And I think it's about bringing together a range of partners at local level to get those schemes off the ground. And as I say, I think Hormus Link are offering support to do that. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. We've, got, we've gone past our um, one o'clock um, cut-off, so I'm going to have to bring, bring things to, to, to a, uh, an end now. Um, I think, uh, apologies for Paul not taking part in the discussion, and apologies to, for, uh, to Paul if you, if you can hear me, but um, uh, certainly in the question and answer box, he's answered um, uh, a, a significant number of questions, so I hope he's um, uh, um, been able to, to talk to people that way. Um, and just um, to, to bring things to a close, I'd really like to thank all of the panellists um, uh, this afternoon. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, we've got through a, a, a decent number of questions and some um, really great food for thought from the presentations as well. Um, so thanks to all concerned. And um, yeah, I'd just like to bring this to, to a close. Thank you all very much. <laughs>